rapture and resurrection. It is clear that the idea of the pre-tribulation rapture has a 19th century origin. The theory is attributed to John Nelson Darby, who lived from 1800 to 1882, but it is also true that the intense interest in prophecy and all things eschatological at the turn of the 19th century, encapsulated by dispensationalism, had much to do with popularizing the hypothesis. Scholarly research has shown that the Greek and Latin church fathers clearly seem to exclude any thought of a pre-tribulation rapture. If the theory were biblical, there wouldn't be any reason to be deterred by its late origin. However, as often happens once the idea became popular, it wasn't long before groups which had entertained it began to get very defensive about any suggestion that the pre-tribulation rapture theory might not be the ultimate answer, and so it was very soon enshrined as sacred doctrine. The term rapture, of course, is not a biblical word, but a theologically developed term coming from Latin, not the Greek or Hebrew. It means literally a snatching, and in the context of 1 Thessalonians 4, a snatching up that is to meet the Lord in the air. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 What this verse in 1 Thessalonians does demonstrate is just what 1 Corinthians 15.50-53 through 53 teaches, namely, that at the Lord's return, the second advent, those believers who are alive will be resurrected without physical death, while believers who have previously passed on will be resurrected first. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 50-57 To apply the theological construct, we would only call the living resurrection a rapture, that is, a snatching up. But this is a distinction that the Scripture does not dwell upon at all, despite the prevalence of the term in contemporary evangelical Christianity. As far as the Bible is concerned, this whole event is the resurrection which occurs at Christ's return at the end of the tribulation, as our Lord explains in the book of Matthew. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Matthew chapter 24 verse 29 through 31. When we add 1 Corinthians to the mix, we get the complete picture. But each in turn, Christ the firstfruits, then when he comes those who belong to him. Then the end will come, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. 1 Corinthians 15, 23 and 24. The words in verse 24, Then the end constitute the third echelon of the resurrection, so that we have in that passage the entire sequence, namely, one Christ, this first echelon of the resurrection has already been completed, two, those who are his at his coming, believers resurrected at the second advent, both living and dead, and three, the end, that is believers, living and dead since the second advent, resurrected at the end of the one thousand years, just before the commencement of the eternal state. 1 Corinthians 3.50-57 supports this view precisely. There are some textual issues with verse 51 which shall be addressed. Paul's main point is that flesh and blood cannot enter that eternal state. Verse 50. 
meaning that there will have to be a final resurrection. And this, of course, is what all Old Testament believers understood from reading Daniel and Isaiah. For example, He will swallow up death forever. The Sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove His people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. Isaiah chapter 25 verse 8 But your dead will live, Lord. Their bodies will rise. Let those who dwell in the dust wake up and shout for joy. Your dew is like the dew of the morning. The earth will give birth to her dead. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 19 Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Daniel chapter 12 verse 2 The mystery in 1 Corinthians verse 51 that is the previously unrevealed divine truth now made more explicit by Paul under divine revelation, is that this transformation into the new body of eternal life will actually occur in stages, with the next stage taking place at Christ's return at the last trumpet, rather than awaiting the end of history in toto.